I was reading the, uh, the River of Fire, right? Is God really good? Did God create hell? I mean, it was interesting, you know. I like it. But, of course, I don't believe in eternal hell. Uh, and uh, my main problem with it was that uh, I talked about, uh, like, free will and stuff like that. I wish I, I agree. You know, the, the, the wicked dig their own pit. And so they suffer because of that, because of their own free choices and stuff like that. But it's still against their free will, right? Because they, whether they be separated eternally from God, or if they be in the presence of God, tormented by God's presence, all of that is still against man's free will. Um, which, uh, the point is that, oh, God respects free will, right? But he's still tormented by God's presence against, you know, man's free will, you know? Because God, uh, Christ descends back up to the Father, Right, and Paul talks about how if one die, all died, right? And so if one ascends back up to the Father, so does everything else. And it's because Christ is is the head of all humanity. Is the new Adam. And so that's why everything goes back up to the Father, because of the work of Christ. And then uh, I was reading it. My, my main problem is not only because it only takes us free will, like, it only pushes the problem step back, like just one step back, because it still goes against you know your free will teaching. There's no, the other problem that I saw was that paradise is the love of God, in which the bliss of all the beatitudes is contained, and that. The tree of life is the love of, of God. Do not deceive yourself, says St. Simon, the new theologian. God is fire, and when he came into the world, he, he became a man, he sent fire on the earth. And he himself says, this fire turns about searching to find material that is disposition and an intention that is good to fall into and to kindle and for those in whom this fire will ignite, and it becomes a great flame which, which reaches heaven. This flame at first purifies us from the pollution of passions, and then it becomes in us food and drink and light and joy, and renders us light ourselves because we participate in his light. God is a loving fire, and he is a loving fire for all. Good or bad, that is, however, a great difference in the way people receive this loving fire of God. St. Basil says that the sword of fire was placed at the gate of paradise to guard the approach to the tree of life. It was a terrible and burning toward infidels, but kindly accessible towards the faithful, bringing them to the light of day. The same loving fire brings the day to those who respond to love with love and burns those who respond to love with hatred. Paradise and hell are one and the same river of God. A loving fire which embraces and covers all with the same beneficial will, without any difference or discrimination. The same vivifying water, a life eternal for the faithful and death eternal for the infidels. For the first, it is their element of life. For the second, it is their instrument of their eternal suffocation. Paradise for the one is hell for the other. Do not consider this strange. The son who loves his father will feel happily, feel happy in his father's arms. But if he does not love him, his, his father's loving embrace will be a torment to him. This is also why when we love the man who hates us, it is likened to the pouring light coals and hot embers on his head. I say, right, St. Isaac the Syrian, that those who are suffering in hell are suffering and being scourged by love. It is totally false to think that the sinners in hell are deprived of God's love. Love is a child of the knowledge of truth and unquestionably given commonly to all. But love's power acts in two ways. It torments sinners while at the same time it delights those who have lived in accordance with it. God is love. If we really believe this truth, we know that God 
never hates, never punishes, never takes vengeance. As Abba Amo says, love never hates anyone, never reproves anyone, never condemns anyone, never grieves anyone, right? Never pours anyone, never faithful, nor infidel, nor stranger, nor sinner, nor fornicator, nor uh, any impure, but instead is precisely sinners and weak and ignorant souls that it, that is loves more and feels pain for them and grieves and laments and feels sympathy for the wicked and sinners more than for the good imitating Christ who called sinners and ate and drank with them. For this reason, showing what real love is, he taught, saying, become good and merciful. Um, Sorry, no, it says, become good and merciful like your Father in heaven, and as he reigns on bad and good, and makes the sun uh, to rise on the just and unjust light, so also is the one who has real love and his compassion and praise for all. And then, uh, it says, now it is for anyone and if anyone is perplexed and does not understand how it is possible for God's love to render anyone painfully wretched and miserable and even burning as it were in flames, let him consider the other brother of the prodigal son. Was he not in his father's estate? Did not everything in it belong to him? Did he not have his father's love? Did, the, did his father not come himself to entreat? And beseech him to come and take part in the joyous banquet. What rendered him miserable and tortured him with inner bitterness and hate? Who refused him anything? Why was he not joyous at his brother's return? Why did he not have love for either towards his father or towards his brother? What was it not because of his was it not because of his wicked inner disposition? Did he not remain in hell because of that? And what was this hell? Was it a separate place? Was there any instrument of torture that he had? Did he not continue to live in the Father's house? What separated him from all of his joyful, his joyous people in the house, if not his brother, right? If not his own hate and his own bitterness, did his father or even his brother stop loving him? Was it not precisely this very love which hardened his heart more and more? Was it not the joy that made him sad was it not hatred burning in his heart towards hatred for his father and his brother so it says uh, hatred for the love of his father toward his brother um, and for the love of his brother toward his father this is hell the negation of love the return of hate for love bitterness and seeing innocent joy to be surrounded by love and to have hate in one's heart this is the eternal condition of all the damned and they are all dearly loved and you know yeah and so and they go basically um yes they're choosing why they're in hell right but not really because the presence of god is against their free will right but the, the, that that's the first problem. But it only pushes the free will problem a step back. Um, the other, you know, problem that I saw with it is that, you know, it, it's kind it kind of like, I could be wrong about it, but in the beginning it talks about uh, why they were expelled from the garden. It talks about the meaning of God's justice, right? The word justice is a translation of the Hebrew word sadaka this word means divine energy which accomplishes man's salvation is parallel and almost synonymous to the other Hebraic word is said which means mercy compassion love and the word and that which means fidelity truth this as you see gives a completely other dimension of what we usually can see as justice this is how the church understood god's justice this is what the fathers of the church taught of it how can you call god just right saint 
Isaac the Syrian. When you read the passage on the wage given to the workers, friend, I do thee no wrong. I will give thee unto this last, even as unto thee who worked for me for the first hour. Is thine eye evil because I am good? How can a man call God just, continues St. Isaac, when he comes across the passage on the prodigal son who wanted his wealth and riots his living, and yet only for the contrition which he showed the father ran and fell upon his neck and gave him authority over all the wealth. None other but his very son said these things concerning him, lest we doubt it, and uh, he bear witness concerning him. Where then? Where then is God's justice? Um, for for whilst we were sinners, Christ died for us. And it talks about. So basically, um, yeah, the divine energy that accomplishes man's salvation. That that is for all, even the wicked. You know, I, I do agree with the fact that. Uh, you know that uh, the the wicked dig their own pit, and they suffer torments in the presence of God, right? Because they practice wickedness instead of dying to themselves. But that that only works if it's a temporary hell, because at the end of the day, you know God's presence is not hellfire, literally. You know it's only perceived that way, and in the garden before the fall, right? Um, Adam's fall, uh, man did not perceive God in that way man's purpose is to perceive god full of light life love and joy and compassion you know it's not really meant to be the purpose of man is not to be tormented by god's presence it's to is to be received correctly and to know god in truth loving compassion just like this book just said but in the end it says that the wicked don't know that right because of their own choices but um but like I said, that's only that poses a problem for God respecting your free will because he doesn't, obviously, you know. And then uh, the second problem was that man's purpose is to experience God the correct way and not to experience God as hellfire. So that would be another problem with the purpose of man and the free will of man. And the third problem I saw was that um, in the end, if they're going to be just tormented by God's presence for all eternity, then what was the purpose of casting them out of the garden in the first place? Because they were already tormented by God's presence. Because they, they, what ended up happening with the corruption with Adam and Eve and God is that their, their relationship became estranged and they saw God differently and they became ashamed and full of fear and torment by God's presence. And so God cast, God cast them out, you see. Because they could no longer eat of the tree of life so they can no longer live forever in this condition. So that was, that's the loving kindness, right? That this book also spoke about how they were cast out of paradise in order to be spared this torment and you know living forever in a corrupt state you see so they were cast out out of loving kindness and the lake of fire is the same thing they are once again cast into not cast out but they were cast into the lake of fire out of that same loving compassion so that they be that they may be free and and you know, free of their corruption. And all that is salvation by the grace of God. It has not much to do with free will. Like you're, you're more than willing to love God freely. That is according to man's very nature, the way he was made for, for God. So you're only practicing the inevitability that all souls, all, all things come back to God and they come back to God in the right way and, and put back in the right place. Um... Another thing that this book didn't mention is that, yeah, love is kind, love does not torment people, love is not abhorrent, right? But, again, love endures all things, and love hopes all things, and love never fails. So th those are just my, some of my problems with the river of fire. Even though I like it, it's unique, and I, I agree with a lot of it, to be honest, I just don't agree with the eternal hell myth fact i think it's just hyperbolic talk because uh 
The Bible speaks like this many times when it talked about the Canaanites being wiped out, annihilated out of existence. And yet in the New Testament, they're still there. They still exist. And I think one of the disciples was a Canaanite. I can't remember. But the, the Canaanites were not wiped out. They were still around. You know, and uh, even though the Bible said that they were wiped out completely and utterly destroyed. And then um, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, like, supposedly it's, it's supposed to be burnt by a never-ending eternal fire that never ends, right? And yet, you can go to the location today and it's not burning with eternal, never-ending fire. There is no eternal, never-ending fire there. So it's obviously not being literal and it's obviously, it was a temporary time. And the eternal fire was God, like everlasting fire. Just like John talks about, and it is perfectly consistent with John. Because John um, talks about experiencing eternal life now, right? Does that mean you get to live forever right now? Of course not. It just means for a temporary time, you get to experience a higher quality of living, a higher quality of spirit, right? That Christ came to give his life, not just to die on a cross, but to give the life of God, which is everlasting life. You see, and yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And then, I mean, I, I think that definition on justice, and you know, it's very helpful. It's very interesting because it, it is the divine energy of God that accomplishes the salvation of man. You see, and all people can be transformed into people of God. Paul was transformed, and he calls himself the chief of sinners. And yet he's the main one that preaches about grace. And he's basically saying that grace has reached the worst of the worst, even the chief of sinners. That is how powerful the grace of God is, you see. And that is the purpose of man, to be with God, to be in paradise with God, you know. So like when the book of Revelation says um, about all of his enemies being subdued finally, and so the gates are never shut, right? They're open. And Christ calls out to them who are outside the kingdom. You know, come all those who thirst for righteousness. That's yes, because God, God can cause the wicked to thirst for righteousness. You know, he can transform a staff into a snake. You know, he can do all of these things. That's why it's like, uh, I don't know, for people who believe in eternal hell, it's, like, it's almost like you guys have no faith. And the power of God. It's like it's all dependent on you. Even though justice as defined even from this book said. It is the energy of God. The grace of God. That accomplishes man's salvation. And not his own energy. Not man's own energy. Like all of man's energy comes from God anyway. So I just have some thoughts on this book. Even though I like it. I disagree with it. And if you like my channel. If I'm wrong that's fine. All we can do is learn. But if you like my channel, like my videos, and please like and subscribe. Thank you and good night.